Oh, hey, we're live. Or, oh, hey, I'm live. And there's nobody here yet, and that's good. <laughs> I knew there'd be one person here. Hey, everybody. Hey, if you're just joining us, uh, my name is Jay. It is officially episode one of uh, what I'm calling Both Laugh, the Dying Scene Live Interviews. Let me see if I can get our first official guests, Michael Kane. Let's see. Waiting for the morning afters. Boy, that has a ring to it. Um... Probably help if I turn my volume up. Whoa. Hey, there you. How's it going? There we go. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm surprised <clears throat> I figured this out. Like, <laughs> I'm, I just, uh, in this whole quarantine thing, I realized that I'm not as good at a lot of this stuff as I oh, thought yeah, I would sure. be. Yeah. So this is, uh, yeah. How are you? I'm not, not doing too bad. I nice. am also surprised I figured this thing out, too. Nice. We did a little trial run last week, me and Dave, the guy who started Dying Scene 10 yep. or 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. He lives in South Africa. And I said, you know, just go big, right? Let's see if we can connect internationally the first yeah, time. Yeah, right. How's the, uh, it's pretty cool. how's the website going? It is still uh, not down, uh, not up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been since Veterans Day, officially. Oh, um, yeah, it's tough. Um, I think that if I think that if everybody had a lot more time on their hands for the last few months, it would have been up by now. But the yeah. amount of work that it needs to be repopulated and it's it's all by the way, it's all Greek to me. Like I don't yeah. understand website stuff. Mm -hmm. So the way he explained it to me, he might as well have been talking in Swahili. Yeah, uh, I get that, but. It, it seems like they have a little bit of time to spend now because mm -hmm. nobody's going anywhere. Yeah. Nobody's uh, going to so, shows for sure. So you got that. Right. Yeah. And I mean, there, there's not a lot of shows in South Africa that they're going to anyway, Good boy. Okay. but they're on, they're on when I when they say lockdown, like we think it's bad here. Cause whatever uh, you, you can't leave your house to walk your dog. You can't go for a walk. You can't go for a run, things like that. If you wow. go to the grocery store, you have to show, receipts you have to have documentation of where you're going because they'll pull you over like they want nobody outside yeah i mean fair enough i mean yeah you know, it seems to be it working <laughs> hey whatever right. works for you right exactly mm. so thanks for uh coming on this is i guess yeah. officially episode one number one uh, i can't um, say i'm number one at much so like i like this <laughs> i'm number one First exactly. Guy. First guy. I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm honored. Thank you. Thanks for doing it. So how's, uh, how's quarantine life treating you? Uh, I mean, I guess the same as everybody, really. It's, uh, I'm working, so it's super bizarre because it's like um, the world has stopped and you're just going about your business and you're going to work and you're coming home and the Red Sox aren't on and there's no shows to go to and you can't have band practice and obviously really trivial things compared to people that are suffering. Um, right. But uh, yeah, it's just weird. It's just weird. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, writing a lot of songs and trying to hash through all that stuff. We were three days away from finishing our record and then shit sprayed all over the fan. And then yeah, really. now uh, we're just, we're sitting on a record that's like almost done. So yeah. yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. One of the whole uh, reasons that I wanted to do this, A, is to keep myself connected because there's no shows to take pictures at and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't publish any interviews because the site's down. But yes. I saw other people using Instagram Live to do this whole split screen thing. I said, well, let's go live. Absolutely. Uh, but one of the things I especially want to do is talk to people who have either had shows canceled, tours canceled, things like that. And then people that are doing cool things to stay connected and mm. stay productive. And so you kind of had both. Cause I think yours was one of the first shows that I remember that got canceled because of this whole thing. Like 
that show at once that was lined up, right? Yeah, we had a show with Kevin Devine at once, and it was one of the first few that got pulled, and we didn't really know until the day before. We were still sort of on the fence about it, and then it really got bad, so they pulled that. I mean, luckily we didn't have any tours, like some of our friends that, like, had whole, like, just – European slash world tours pulled. It was just a few local shows for us, but um, yeah, it was it was. Geez, I couldn't even tell you when it was. It feels like a different lifetime, <laughs> like, yeah, right? Like when shows happened. Like I even watch TV now, and I'm I look at it going like, why are they so close together on that show? <laughs> yeah, right. Like I don't get it. They should be farther yeah. apart. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Every show that we've watched, even shows that came out. My daughter's been rewatching the entire Gilmore Girls from start to finish. Oh, good. And so yeah. even, even conversations in there and like everything I feel like relates to quarantine life now. And so I think about things the way we think about them just for the last six weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, um, and you, you watch the stranger shit too, cause I'm a big Red Sox fan. So yeah, I watch almost all the games and, um, without the Red Sox on, like I'm, I'm digging into YouTube on the TV. I'm big into watching <laughs> disc golf. So I'm watching the disc golf championship from like 2018 on YouTube. I'm watching that. And I've watched the first two seasons of Doogie Hauser. So no lie. It's on disc, Hulu. Yeah. Disc golf. Is, is that, that's the Frisbee golf? The Frisbee is that golf. Correct? You're supposed to call it disc golf. The Sorry. layman call it Frisbee, but yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so but it is with frisbees, right? It is with frisbees. I even bought one of the baskets. Like, yeah, I'm all yeah. In. I bought the baskets. I bought the, uh, you know, quarantine does some shit. You know, it does some shit. The guy that me. lived upstairs from us was a big disc golf player for a while, and he would put the put the net in the backyard mm -hmm. and throw. Are you supposed to call them frisbees or discs? You would Disc. throw discs. You throw all discs. Over the yard. Yep, yeah. it, it's it's harder than it looks. It's yeah. not easy. So. I'm, mm -hmm. I believe it. Yeah, the rock skipping. My, either my wife or my daughter posted. There, uh, there was a rock skipping competition oh, on TV it. the other day. Saw it. Yes. Did you? Yeah. Yes. It's From on... somewhere in Michigan, I think. Yeah, that was bizarre too. Um, yeah. But yeah, the strangest shit. You're finding the strangest shit. Like I said, in between trying to finish songs to get them to squeeze on the record, um, now that we got a little bit of time, to just watching the strangest stuff. That's pretty much all I've been doing. <laughs> so in ordering weird stuff online and like friends records i know this weekend they're doing a, another band camp thing where they they're not taking any money yeah. so i have a list of things i want to pick up try to help out you know yeah that's great yeah so let's uh for people that might not know let's give a little bit of the backstory of michael kane in the morning afters cool yeah can. Um, i think from around here people know who you are but yeah. from outside, where did Michael Caine in the morning after come yeah. from? Yeah, so we, um, we started in 2016 um, by total chance. Um, my cousin who passed away, I, I was in every band with him, and we, he had a, a vintage Gibson SG that had the neck snapped on it. So I posted on Facebook, I said, uh, I said uh, who repairs these things? Like, who can I get? And somebody tagged Franklin in it who I didn't know. I didn't know. Oh, him. really? Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, strangely enough, I saw broken stereo a couple times and he was in that. So I had yeah. seen him, but I didn't know him. And right. we, we started talking and he, uh, he fixed it and it looked great and it played great. And then he said, Hey, my, he, he was in a cover band at the time and they were playing a show and he asked me to open up solo. And I did. And it was the first show I played in, uh, I played a show at the Midway. It was the first time I played in almost 10 years. Um, wow. Yeah. So it was, I took a long break. And uh, so Frank was like, if you ever want to get a band together to do these songs. And I was like, right on. So I got him. Yeah. Got a few other dudes. We changed the lineup a bunch of times and yeah. we're happy with what we have now. And then uh, we demoed a bunch of songs and Mark from State Line Records, who I've been a friend with forever. Yeah. I just sent him the song saying, you want to hear these? Like, you know, take a listen. And he was like, I want to put them out. So the seven inch that we put out in 2017 was really never meant to come out. It was just something that he enjoyed. Like we weren't recording thinking like, 
Oh yeah. This, oh, okay. We we did it all live, so there's really yeah. barely any overdubs on it. And he really liked it. He wanted to put it out. We did ten songs and he picked four. And um wow. Yeah, he picked four and we put that out. And ever yep. since then we've been trying to record a full length. This is our fourth time in the studio trying to record this full full length. I didn't like the way yeah. it sounded. I didn't like the way it felt. Yeah. I felt some of the songs were kind of old and I just didn't enjoy it. So new batch of songs, slightly vamped lineup. We added Joe on keys, which is a world oh, of difference. Right. And um, yeah, right now where, I mean, who knows now we could get in a room and totally forget how to play our songs. But before yeah, right. all this started, like, I feel like we're as strong as we could be. And uh, the record's almost done and we just need to wait till the studio opens up again. And, uh, get back at it you know because you launched you launched the kickstarter right before or it closed the kickstarter kind of right before that was by the happened, skin right? of our teeth really yeah. um i've always been against it kickstarters um just because I, yeah because i kind of felt like i don't know i kind of felt like it's almost not taken advantage of but maybe i felt that like nobody's gonna care about this like i'm gonna put a kickstarter up and i'm just gonna be staring at the screen at that zero dollar <laughs> just like w waiting right. for it um but people donated and i was shocked and um it was awesome for us because we would have just been piecemealing it together for the next two years you know right um because it's not cheap to do all that um you know so that was really awesome. And just by the skin of our teeth, we we wrapped up probably in like December on the Kickstarter, fit in January, right around there. Yeah. If we had waited any longer, like nobody in their right minds running a Kickstarter now, like <laughs> give us your money right. so I can put our little record out. Meanwhile, right. the world is collapsing. So by the skin right. of our teeth, we, the Kickstarter happened. People were really interested. In it, and I think we had kind of cool perks Meanwhile, this week, I'm making 18 mixtapes for people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, three of them want actual tapes, cassette tapes. Really? Yeah, and I'm ready to do it. And I think 14 want so CDs. Did you buy them all before everybody shut down? Like you just had cassette tapes on hand? Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Ready? <clears throat> <laughs> you see that? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I have cassette wow. tapes, right? Yeah, right. And then a few people want like Spotify mixtapes. It's like not as fun, yeah. but I'll do it. So, um, yeah. so we had really cool perks and people dug it and um, we were blown away. Every day we'd be texting each other being like, why is this hat? This, this isn't making sense. <laughs> like yeah, there's right. so many cool bands out there. Why is this happening? So we were really flattered that people gave a shit. So um, yeah, we just got to, get in a room and finish it. It's mostly done. All the drums are done. All the bass is done. 90% of the guitars are done. We just need keys, some vocals, and then some bells and whistles and we'll be done. Mixed and they'll just need to be mixed and mastered. And yeah. So. Well, it, launching a successful Kickstarter then sort of forces you to actually finish it. So you can't sort of screw around because now you have deadlines, right? We, we, well, we don't have deadlines necessarily, but, for me, it's I mean, nobody has deadlines now. But. <laughs> no. Well, for me, it's the exact <laughs> opposite. Like, even talking, you know, to Franklin, who's who out of the – who's the only, like, original member, you know, we've always gone in with 500 bucks in our pocket, and we needed to just play live, bang it out, not necessarily worry about tones, just try to dial something mm -hmm. in that's okay and kind of run with it. But now – we do have a little bit of breathing room where we can kind of go in and take advantage of like all the vintage amps that they have at this place and, you know, really sort of get into making a record as to oppose of like, let's just see how many live songs we can bang out. So yeah. yeah. Does getting to play around with the cool gear, does that sort of change songs um, or change the way you yeah, structure it, things? Or, it doesn't yeah. change. It, it, cha it adds like, like, um, we record in Wachusa recording um, oh, okay. with Roger Lavalle out in Princeton, Mass. And uh, he has a 12-string Rickenbacker. So, like, if there's any reason why I'm going to this studio, I love Roger and he's great. <laughs> right. And he has a lot of really cool vintage, like, Vox amps and, yeah. like, 
but um, he has a 12 string Rickenbacker, right? Okay. So all over the record, you'll hear little like chimey yeah, shit. Yeah. Um, right. That like I grew up on all that stuff, so like yeah. I'm really happy to do that. So yeah, you just have a lot of freedom, you know. When the drummer has seven snare drums to choose from, and he's not just bringing his beat up one, like it's just it's kind of cool, and it's not a luxury yeah. that we usually have. So yeah, where is Princeton, Massachusetts? As somebody who's lived here forever, I don't know Princeton. It's kind of like if you go by Worcester, almost like you're going to. Uh, <sighs> If you're going out towards like sort of Fitchburgy, Lemonster, okay. kind of like out in yeah. that direction, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's a nice little studio, and it's yeah, we're super comfortable there too. So um, yeah, because you're from you're from Worcester originally. Yeah, just just right? out, yeah the safe suburbs. Yeah, just outside of Worcester. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. If there are people that are watching, I know a few people that have checked in that aren't from around here. Worcester is like due west of Boston, about an hour, you'd say. Yeah. And it, it might as well be Ohio to a lot of people. It's like Worcester is the end of uh, civilization. It's like Worcester, Ohio, California, I think, if you drive west in that order. it's Because I grew up in Nashua, so like an hour mm. north of Boston. Yep. I don't think I set foot in Worcester until I was an adult because there was never a reason to, because shows that would, uh, yeah, Worcester, uh, shows would go to Boston and we'd go there or they'd go to Providence or they'd go to like the Elvis room in Portsmouth. Yep. So there was never a reason to go. To, and I actually, because of this, went to look through my whole list of shows. I've kept a list of every show I've oh, ever been to. Oh, nice. Try That's to find killer. things from Worcester. I, I mean, obviously I've been to the Palladium. I saw uh -huh. Springsteen at the DCU Center. The center yeah, Central, and, yep. And I couldn't think of anything else. I can't find anything else. Yeah, we, um, growing up, we always went to Providence. Um, yeah. Just because it was easy. So we went down to Club Babyhead a lot. Um, the old yeah. Met a lot. Uh, the Living Room, Lupo's, like clubs like that. Every once in a great while, we'd journey up to the Elvis Room. Not often. But yeah. if there was like something yeah. going on. We were like, you know what? We got to go to the Elvis Room. We'd go. Right. Um, and then, um, yeah. And then Boston was kind of like, the, I mean, the rat, we went, we took yeah. the train in on Sundays to go to the rat. Um, but Worcester, Worcester and Boston are this weird thing where it's like, when we play a show in our hometown in Worcester, it's like getting people from Boston is like a, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough sell. Yeah. So we yeah, usually throw a right. few friends on, like we play Ralph's or if we play Hotel Vernon, we'll throw a few of our Boston friends bands on and they'll drag yeah, yeah. a few people out. Um, but yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough. Um, it really, it's Worcester might as well be Ohio for I, a lot of people. I, I tell so people that, yeah. My day job is for a hospital that's based in Worcester mm -hmm. and when it's a rehab. And so you, we try to recruit people. We take people from all over the place. Uh, but when you tell them that it's in Worcester, they're like, uh, uh, I don't want to go to Worcester. I'm like, well, we'll pick you up. Like, we have transportation. You don't have to worry about it. Because Worcester, <laughs> they feel it sounds like it's Cleveland. Uh, but yeah. it's not. Yeah. Were there were there venues in Worcester? Were there places to play back in the uh, mid-90s? Yeah. I remember um, we used to put shows on at Ralph's. And I oh, okay. remember, I remember, and my memory is, Pretty terrible, yeah, yeah. pretty terrible. Right. But me and my cousin put on a show at Ralph's with. So, ah, uh, fuck. Showcase Showdown headlined. And okay. Th and then there was a bunch of local bands. And it yeah, was yeah. the first show we ever put on. We didn't know how to put on a show. But we did. Yeah. We put on this fucking yeah. show at Ralph's. I remember walking up to Tom after the show from Showcase Showdown and yeah. paying him in like a Ziploc bag of like <laughs> fucking quarters and buttons. And it was like, right. it's all we, it's all right. we have. Meanwhile, like 50 kids came to the show, but I think I started paying right. like the lesser known bands first. Like I had no clue how yeah. to do this. Um, right. But yeah, we put on shows at Ralph's. There was the Espresso Bar, which was a big club in Worcester that um, I met a lot of friends at that I still see 
like um, the Westies, if you remember them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like Doug, who ended up being in uh, Ducky Boys and James from Dropkick Murphys, had the Westies. Yeah. And we'd go see them, and they were kids. They were a lot younger than me. Um, but yeah, there was a fun little sort of scene because a lot of kids from Western Mass would come to Worcester. Oh, okay. So we didn't have to worry about Boston. We didn't have to worry about that. Boston kind of came to Worcester at some point. Yeah. Like, it got to a point where there was enough sort of buzz where like Dropkick Murphys would come and play the espresso bar. And uh, maybe know. I did go to the espresso bar. Yeah. I, Cause I, there's one show from back then that I couldn't place. Like I wrote who I saw, but I couldn't place. Hmm. But I feel like now that you mentioned the espresso bar, maybe I think I did see showcase show down there. You and definitely like, could have. Yeah. The McVeigh's. If you remember the McVeigh's. Yeah. Yeah. And then this band, the Double O Zeros, and I remember nothing at all about them. But you, I, you, we went for Showcase Showdown. You probably did, because the thing about Espresso Bar is it was when, like, punk was really booming. It was like, if you were on Epitaph, you might as well have been on a major label. I mean, there was some... Yeah, right. Was, so Espresso Bar would get, like, the business. They did that business okay. Dropkicks tour. And I remember once yeah. they had um, the U.S. Bombs came. And if you don't know the Espresso Bar, it's in all ages... Alcohol free, drug free, <laughs> sort right. of club. And there was a bar next door. It was London Billiards next door. And I, I know I'm not speaking out of school here, but like Dwayne was so fucking shit faced at this show <laughs> with a bunch yeah. of kids. I mean, it was fucking unbelievable. Right. But it was all kids. It was fucking kids. Right. It was like 20 year olds. But like they would pull in these huge bands because it was just like, it was at the time where those bands, you couldn't have enough clubs. They would sell out wherever they went. You know, they, yeah. they, would, they would sell out wherever they went because, I mean, it was huge. You know, Bouncing Souls, Blank 77 were really big at the time. Bands like that. I mean. I forgot about Blank 77 until you said that. Wow. Yeah, they, they played a bunch. I mean, it wasn't really a crowd I was sort of in with, the sort of spiky. Yeah. It, it's yeah, not yeah, right. kind of my thing because, I mean, I grew up just on, like, fucking classic rock. So I didn't grow yeah. up on like punk rock. I grew up on like right. the Beatles and Tom Petty and like Bob Dylan. Right. So like the spiky right. screaming shit, just like I, I, at the time I couldn't handle it. Um, now I have a yeah. lot of friends that do it and it's great, but yeah, at the time um, I couldn't do it, but yeah, it was such a cool scene at the time. And then it sort of just went away. And espresso bar went away. So when did that shut down? Um, did they shut down or did they just stop doing shows? They shut down. They they totally went out of business. It was it was probably like early two thousands. Okay. Yeah, if I'd have to say. And um and then I stopped doing music for a long time. So I obviously still always went to shows and but I just stopped doing yeah. music. So um yeah. Um it's uh why just kind of got sick of it? Or? Life, you know, it's kinda yeah. like you know, you get married or you well, I had a kid when I was real young and that sort of made me be like i can't go on tours i can't i gotta be around yeah. and uh right. you know just so yeah life kind of got in the way but i always wrote songs i had notebooks full of songs but i just didn't have a band and i didn't play shows i just i didn't record i didn't do anything i just had notebooks of songs so yeah. um yeah um but so uh when why did you get back into it that's when your cousin passed that yeah my cousin like passed away and um i never thought i would do a band again really i was just like he was in every band I was ever in. I was kind of like, ah, yeah. I, I just, I didn't want to do it. But then when Franklin sort of, you know, dug the songs enough and he was like, let's do something. I was like, this will be good. And then we made, yeah. I made of, I made a, an EP with my son and one of my other cousins yeah, yeah, yeah. called uh, adding insult to industry. And there's four songs on that. And we put it out. We made a little record release show. And I thought, this is going to be the only show we're going to play, but it's going to be great. Like, we're going to play this yeah. one show, and it's going to be fucking awesome. And our friends are going to show yeah. up. And we did it. And uh, and then there was just more shows. And, you know, it was, just kept going and going. So, yeah. yeah. What do you think your favorite show you've played, your favorite lineup? Because you played with some cool bands. Uh, yeah, it's a tough call. I mean – we did wreck the halls in 2017 and mm -hmm. um that was cool because i mean i have a lot of respect for those guys and what they do and how they run things and uh but it was also like 
I mean, anybody in the Boston music scene knows how well you get treated at the Sinclair if you play the Sinclair. Yeah, it, right. it, it, it's not like a secret. Like, right. when you right. play there, you're treated like a real musician like you're treated like a yeah. real band they're like when would you like food del food delivered to your green room type <laughs> of shit like all the monitors right. work and they sound yeah. great like it's just yeah it's unbelievable so you're like your name's on the backdrop and it's just like right it's like shit that you just like fucking read about so that they was treat probably, me nice and i'm nobody <laughs> like dude, i don't play in a band dude it's, i it's, take pictures sometimes and they're yeah. awesome to me so, dude yeah. it's, it's great but you know i mean Honestly, as like I get older, it's like we we played with some pretty cool bands, um, and a lot of bands like that are heroes, like Swing and Utters we played with. Um, Wait, yeah. Uh, uh, but um, you just want to play with your friends, really, is what it really comes yeah. down to. You know, you just yeah, want to yeah. play shows with your friends, and it's. Yeah. I'm happy if I can play with a lot of the bands that I like in Boston. Like I'm all good. Like. It's, yeah. it's cool to get on like thrown on like a show like we played with the dead did you go to that dead boys show i didn't no we played with the dead boys at once was that at Brayton? oh once it was okay. at once and like it was really cool like i mean they were great they were really yeah. great and um i always like playing shows where i feel like we're like the odd the odd band you know what i mean <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so um that was like a punk a punk rock show and i yeah, felt right. like we were kind of the odd band and i always like doing that i always like being that so like it's really cool like i said to play with some of those bands but when you can play with friends of yours that's really where it's at whether it's up in lowell or whether it's in you know at o'brien's or whether wherever yeah like that that's where it's at like that that's why it's fun you know that swing and utters bill was pretty cool and weird too though wasn't it wasn't it you guys and uh Gallows Bound? Gallows Bound, Gallows Bound and then yeah. Swing Another. That was pretty yeah, eclectic. Yeah, it was a, eclectic. It was a killer lineup, and it was like, um, I mean, Swing and Utters are like, yeah, right. fuck. Like, I mean, you know, <laughs> who, who doesn't like the Swing and Utters? They're like one of those bands where, like, they're not, um, you know, they're not a band that people are wishy-washy on. Like right. they're just one of those bands that did it right. They took some time off. They did what they needed to yeah. do. And like every record just keeps getting fucking better and better. So to play with them was just like, <laughs> like, you know, that's a cool room up there too. Yeah, it is. That's a cool spot. Where, yeah. um, where did the transition to punk rock come from, from your classic rock upbringing? Cause that sounds like our upbringings are sort of the same, just like an hour apart, but yeah. where did the transition into punk rock Come um, from. You know, if I had to connect the dots, like I grew up listening to, I mean, the Beatles, like first tape I ever got was the White Album, followed by Thriller and Born in the USA. And I wore all those out. So That's from there, it, it just went to Tom Petty. It went to Bob yeah. Dylan heavy when I was, I mean, yeah. I mean, imagine going on the bus and there's all the back patches <laughs> and there's the thin mustaches and there's the poofy sneakers and there's the whole thing. And you have your yeah. Bob Dylan, you know, your Bob Dylan tape right. on. I remember in 1991, I remember this specifically, 91, 92, right around there, I got on the bus and some kid was like, what are you listening to? And I was like, traveling Wilburys, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like, what the fuck, right? So I was so kind of bummed about it that I went yeah. out and bought what I thought was a fucking metal just oh <laughs> when they find out i'm listening to this the, yeah, yeah they're gonna fucking love me right right so i went out and bought a record that's still one of my favorite records to this day that came out right around then and they still continued to shit all over me and it was the first black crows record shaking money maker that's a great record yeah, yeah, like, yeah they yeah. have long hair they're wearing oh, yeah right fucking leather pants <laughs> They were in leather pants. I remember saying right. that to a kid. They had leather pants. Like, what are you doing? Right. So after that, it was really just Nirvana that did it. It was yeah. Nirvana in like 91, 92. And then seeing Nirvana in 93 on the In Utero tour, you know, and then everybody's dying their hair and then punk rock and yeah. then Green Day. And then, you know, and then it just, and then it went from there, really. I mean, that's. 
did Nirvana ever come through Worcester in those early days? Because they would play in the early, early days. They would play places like I Ralph's think they Central. played Clark University, I think, I want to say. Oh, okay. Like one of the small rooms at Clark. I'm not 100% sure, but I think they did. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't old enough to really be allowed to go see them alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the first concert I went to was in 1989. And by the time I really got into them, it was like 92. And I was like a freshman in high school. And my mom, I don't think my mother's like, I'm not going to let you go to this. Right. But right. by the time they came back around and played in Springfield on the In Utero tour, I was allowed to yeah. go. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, Nirvana was a big, was a big deal. Um, and right around the same time, of course, it was like the Ramones and the Clash. So, yeah. yeah, I feel like I did it the right way as far as, you know, like, I feel like I got pretty eclectic taste, which I, which, which is helpful, especially when you're writing songs, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because even the way that you write and even the covers that you record are not sort of your traditional covers. You'll cover a lot of bands from like your your early listening days, whether it's Dylan or Tom Petty or mm. stuff like that. I think that stuff is cool. Yeah. Well, it's, um, and it's, it's nice having the band that we do because we're all from such different backgrounds. Uh, you know, like Timmy and, um, Timmy and Franklin are younger than me and, yeah. you know, pop punk and, and, and stuff like that and metal and, you know, Jeff, our drummer, a lot of hardcore stuff. And, um, so it's cool to have that sort of um, wealth of just listening experience in a band, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, it's helped for sure. Yeah. And it sort of gives you a sound that's a little bit like you're able to sort of uh, accurately cover a lot of different ground. You know what I mean? You don't have a sound necessarily because you could fit in with a rock and roll show, a air quotes rock and roll show, yeah. or a punk rock show, and all points in between. Yeah, I think that's important too for us, anyways. And but it's just like, it's just you grow up listening to things, and it's like it's just what you know. Like nobody, I don't think anybody really sits down and be like, "I'm gonna write a song that sounds like," you know. You just get yeah. an idea in your head, and you sit down and you write it, and you know. But for me, it's just like it's like studying. It's like yeah. when you, when you listen to music, you study and you just like at the end of a line, you're like, well, Tom Petty would go up. Bruce Springsteen yeah. would go down. It's just like, right. you're stealing, but you're not, you're just taking inflections kind of. And it's, yeah. and right. it, and it's, I think it's awesome. You know, it's, it's the best part about doing it, you know? Well, I think we're also in an age where it's, I don't want to say, okay but it's okay to admit that you have those influences like Tom Petty and Bruce Springsteen. I think for a while, mid nineties, it was maybe not so cool to admit you liked Bruce Springsteen and Tom Petty and Johnny Cash and all that. Yeah, it wasn't, <laughs> it definitely wasn't well, cool. Um, oh, I know. Um, but yeah, it got cool. And I don't know why, I don't know how. Yeah. I mean, it's stuff that I, I've listened to, but yeah. I vividly remember going to a specific day, going to Newbury Comics in Nashua, mm -hmm. and I bought three albums the same day. I bought a Mr. T Experience, Love is Dead. Okay, yeah. I bought a, uh, do you remember John Cougar Concentration Camp? Oh, yeah, yeah. I bought a John Cougar Concentration Camp record that had uh, hurt so, their cover of Hurt So Good on it, which I thought was a riot. Yeah. And then I bought Springsteen's Greatest Hits. And I remember the look of the guy behind the counter looking at <laughs> Bruce Springsteen's greatest hits. And I totally bailed. I was like, oh, it's, it's for my mom. Because <laughs> I, I wanted to be cool. I was whatever, 17. I wanted to be cool. And you yeah. couldn't have a Bruce Springsteen greatest hits record. Uh, but that record is fire. <laughs> I mean, yeah. His greatest hits record, it's like, it's unfair. Like, same thing, yeah. same thing with Tom Petty. Like, I get into debates about Tom Petty with people. Cause that's what I do. I just argue about music with people, but um, <laughs> like, you can't, from Massachusetts. yeah, you can't name <laughs> an American songwriter with more distinguishable songs. You can't, you can't, I could list you 15 Tom Petty songs that my mom knows and who's yeah, not even right. like a big, but I mean, if you just go right down a dream, free fall and won't back down American girl refuge. I mean, there's so many, yeah, it's, it's right. unbelievable. 
Right. And uh, last year we got to play in Gainesville, and I was just nerding out the whole time. Oh, I, think, yeah. I think my yeah. band was just like, "What's he doing?" <laughs> I just I dropped right. them off at Fest in the morning, and I got in the rental car and I drove around to like all these old houses. I'm like, he lived there. Like I found all the spots. Yeah, I couldn't right. get a soul right. to go with me, but. Actually, That's a riot. A couple guys in Secret Spirit wanted to go with me, but I think they slept in, and I was just up and at them. So <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, right. they had a they had a much better fest than I did, I think, <laughs> or more fun. <laughs> well, <laughs> depends on what you consider best. Because I would in, totally work out on that stuff. I'm also in my in my forties, so like they're not. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, but um. No, and I'm glad I finally one of the last shows I went to before uh, the plague happened. Um, Secret Spirit played at. That band is awesome. I'm glad I finally got to see them. That band rules. Yeah, they're like, they're one of those bands that just like, the second you see them, you're like, yep. Yeah, they got, exactly. Like, like, they give you goosebumps, kind of. You're like, all right, they're, yeah. I mean, j just seeing them for, I, I saw them at, they played a show in Worcester at, um, at Hotel Vernon. I forget who else played, but, um, Anytime it's like a show there, I try to like stop in. And, like I want to like yeah. pay and like whatever. And I didn't know who they were and I didn't know them. And I saw them and I was yeah. like, what the fuck? Like sometimes there's bands where like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm glad we don't play that kind of music because like, yeah, yeah. It, it would make you just want to hang up your guitar. Like right. I'm not right. going to be that good. Like I can't, right. I can't do it. Like they're so fucking great. Um, like imagine following them on a bill. <laughs> oh <laughs> uh, yeah i mean we haven't had we, we've played with them yeah, we haven't had right. to follow them i would yeah. i would try not to um right we played with them at the shaskeen recently oh, yeah. which was yeah. a really fun night that's was, a fun place yeah it's the first time i've ever been so yeah it was a great tim place. berry that's one of tim berry's favorite places to play that's he what comes up and plays there every year that's and he just like he he fell in love with Manchester. He <laughs> walks the train tracks. He goes down to the river and fishes, and it's really oh, wow. awesome and weird. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. all in, huh? Yeah, yeah, he loves it up here for whatever reason. Yeah, no, it's a great little club. I'm uh, got to get back there when this hall ends. <laughs> we all. <do. laughs> I mean, it's going to be funny. It's going to kind of be like once once there starts being shows, are people going to go? Like, are people going to yeah. go out to shows? Are people going right. to be jaded? Or right. are people going to feel like we got to get in all the fun we can in case this happens again? Like, I don't know. Right. It's going to be interesting to see I, what happens. I I posted something just on my Facebook page the other day and Daniel from Rebuilder who books a bunch of different clubs in Boston, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, the Hong Kong and Charlie's especially. And he's like, what happens if we open up, but they cut capacities at clubs. Mm -hmm. So the club capacity is 90 but what's because of social distancing, what if they only allow 55 in now? Mm -hmm. And then what does that do to a show? And does that even warrant, is it even worth having shows if they're going to cut capacities that small? And uh, Yeah. Like, I mean, I kind of think, I mean, I could be wrong, but I kind of think that it's almost going to be like bands are going to be forced to take a step down as far as the venues mm -hmm. they play because Let's say you're a band, and I can't even think of one, but let's say you're a band that's worked through the whole scene. You started playing O'Brien's, and then you yeah. played Great Scott, and then you played Sinclair. And like a band that's just really, like, yeah, yeah. you may, for the sake of people's well-being in the scene, like, it would be great for a big band to go, you know what, we're going to do five nights at O'Brien's. We're going to yeah. do five nights at Great Scott, a band that could sell out who knows what. Because it right. would just jumpstart things, I think. Because if you do have a lower capacity, I don't know. Do you have a higher ticket price? I don't know. I mean, it's right. It's going to be something. I mean, bottom line, people are just going to have to go out and support and, you know, and see what and happens. It's a matter of what phase of society getting back to normal does going to shows come in. Like, is that one of the first things that happens or is that like, the end? no, I mean, I know, like, I know, I know California said no, no shows till 2021. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't make, I kind of feel like that's where we're headed. It just doesn't make sense as much as I want to go to a show. It just, I, I mean, I don't know what it would take for me to be comfortable in a room with 200 people right now. I, I, I certainly right. wouldn't do it now, but I mean, who knows? 
Yeah, or do you put seats in at shows? <laughs> like, I don't know. Speaking of the Sinclair, I went to one show at Sinclair last year and that I walked into is Craig Finn from Waiting for the Morning Afters. Boy, that has a ring to it. Um, probably help if I turn my volume up. Whoa. Hey, there right. you. How's it going? There we go. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm surprised <clears throat> I figured this out. Like, <laughs> I'm, I just, uh, in this whole quarantine thing, I realized that I'm not as good at a lot of this stuff as I oh, thought yeah, I would sure. be. Yeah. So this is, uh, yeah. How are you? I'm not, not doing too bad. Nice. I am also surprised I figured this thing out too. Nice. We did a little trial run last week. Me and Dave, the guy who started Dying Scene 10 yep. or 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. He lives in South Africa, and I said, you know, just go big, right? Let's see if we can connect internationally the first yeah, time. Yeah, right? How's the, uh, it's pretty cool. how's the website going? Waiting for the morning afters. Boy, that has a ring to it. Um, probably help if I turn my volume up. Whoa. Hey, right. there you how's it going? There we go. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm surprised <clears throat> I figured this out. Like, <laughs> I'm, I just, uh, in this whole quarantine thing, I realized that I'm not as good at a lot of this stuff as I oh, thought yeah, I would sure. be. Yeah. So this is, uh, yeah, how are you? I'm not, not doing too bad. Nice. I am also surprised I figured this thing out, too. Nice. We did a little trial run last week, me and Dave, the guy who started Dying Scene 10 yep. or 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. He lives in South Africa, and I said, you know, just go big, right? Let's see if we can connect internationally the first yeah, time. Yeah, right? How's the, uh, it's pretty cool. how's the website going? It is still uh, not down, uh, not up. Ah. Um, <laughs> it's been since Veterans <laughs> Day, officially. Oh, man. Um, yeah, it's tough. Um, I think that if... I think that if everybody had a lot more time on their hands for the last few months, it would have been up by now, but the yeah. amount of work that it needs to be repopulated. And it's, it's all, by the way, it's all Greek to me. Like I don't yeah. understand website stuff. So mm -hmm. the way he explained it to me, he might as well have been talking in Swahili. Yeah. Uh, I get that. But it, it seems like they have a little bit of time to spend now because mm -hmm. nobody's going anywhere. Yeah. Nobody's uh, going to so, shows for sure. So you got that. Right. Yeah, and I mean, there, there's not a lot of shows in South Africa that they're going to anyway. Good boy, okay. But they're on, they're on, when, I, when they say lockdown, like we think it's bad here because whatever. Uh, you, you can't leave your house to walk your dog. You can't go for a walk. You can't go for a run, things like that. If you wow. go to the grocery store, you have to show receipts. You have to have documentation of where you're going because they'll pull you over. Like they want nobody outside. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. I mean... Yeah, you know, seems to be it working. <laughs> hey, whatever right. works for you, right? Exactly. Mm. So thanks for uh, coming on. This is, I guess, yeah. officially episode one. Number one. Uh, I can't um, say I'm number one at much. So, like, I like <laughs> this. I'm number one. First exactly. Guy. First guy. I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm honored. Thank you. Thanks for doing it. So how's, uh, how's quarantine life treating you? Uh, I mean, I guess the same as everybody, really. It's, uh, I'm working. So it's super bizarre because it's like um, the world has stopped and you're just going about your business and you're going to work and you're coming home and the Red Sox aren't on and there's no shows to go to and you can't have band practice and obviously really trivial things compared to people that are suffering. Um, right. But uh, yeah, it's just weird. It's just weird. So uh but yeah, I mean, writing a lot of songs and trying to hash through all that stuff. We were three days away from finishing our record and then shit sprayed all over the fan. And then yeah, really. now uh, we're just we're sitting on a record that's like almost done. So, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. One of the whole uh, reasons that I wanted to do this, A, is to keep myself connected because there's no shows to take pictures at and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't publish any interviews because the site's down. But yes. I saw other people using Instagram Live to do this whole split screen thing. I said, well, let's go live. Absolutely. Uh, 
but one of the things I especially want to do is talk to people who have either had shows canceled, tours canceled, things like that. And then people that are doing cool things to stay connected and mm. stay productive. And so you kind of had both because I think yours was one of the first shows that I remember that got canceled because of this whole thing. Like that show at once that was lined up, right? Yeah, we had a show with Kevin Devine at once. And it was one of the first few that got pulled. And we didn't really know until the day before. We were still sort of on the fence about it. And then it really got bad. So they pulled that. I mean, luckily, we didn't have any tours like some of our friends that like had whole like just european slash world tours pulled it was just a few local shows for us but um yeah it was it was geez i couldn't even tell you when it was it feels like a different lifetime <laughs> like, yeah, right like when shows happened like i even watch tv now and i'm i look at it going <laughs> like why are they so close together on that show <laughs> yeah right like i don't get it they should be farther yeah. apart so yep. <laughs> yeah yeah Every show that we've watched, even shows that came out, my daughter's been rewatching the entire Gilmore Girls from start to finish. Oh, good. And so yeah. even, even conversations in there and like everything I feel like relates to quarantine life now. And so I think about things the way we think about them just for the last six weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, um, and you, you watch the strangest shit too, because I'm a big Red Sox fan. So yeah. I watch almost all the games. And um, without the Red Sox on, like, I'm, I'm digging into YouTube on the TV. I'm big into <laughs> watching disc golf. So I'm watching the disc golf championship from, like, 2018 on YouTube. I'm watching that. And I've watched the first two seasons of Doogie Hauser. So <laughs> no lie. It's on disc, Hulu. Yeah. Disc golf. Is, is that – that's the Frisbee golf? The Frisbee that, golf. Right? You're supposed to call it disc golf. The Sorry. layman call it Frisbee. But, yes. <laughs> um Yes, yeah, so but it is with frisbees, right? It is with frisbees. I even bought one of the baskets. Like yeah, I'm yeah, all yeah. In. I bought the baskets. I bought the, uh, you know, quarantine does some shit. You know, it does some shit. Guy that lived upstairs from us was a big disc golf player for a while, and he would put the put the net in the backyard mm -hmm. and throw. Are you supposed to call them frisbees or discs? You would yeah. throw discs you from throw all discs. over the yard. Yep, yeah. it, it's it's harder than it looks. It's yeah. not easy. So. I, mm -hmm. I believe it. Yeah, the rock skipping. My, either my wife or my daughter posted. There, uh, there was a rock skipping competition oh, on TV it. the other day. Saw it. Yes. Did you? Yeah. Yes. From it's somewhere on... in Michigan, I think. Yeah, that was bizarre too. Um, yeah. But yeah, the strangest shit. You're finding the strangest shit. Like I said, in between trying to finish songs to get them to squeeze on the record. Um, now that we got a little bit of time, to just watching the strangest stuff. That's pretty much all I've been doing. So, in ordering weird stuff online and like friends' records, I know this weekend they're doing a, another Bandcamp thing where they they're not taking any money. Yeah. So I have a list of things I want to pick up, try to help out. You know. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So let's uh, for people that might not know, let's give a little bit of the backstory of Michael Caine and the Morning Afters. Cool. Yeah. You can. Um, I think from around here, people know who you are. But yeah. from outside, where did Michael Caine in the morning after come yeah. from? So we, um, we started in 2016 um, by total chance. Um, my cousin who passed away, I, I was in every band with him. And we, he had a, a vintage Gibson SG that had the neck snapped on it. So I posted on Facebook. Rocky. I said, uh, I said uh, who repairs these things? Like, who can I get? And somebody tagged Franklin in it who i didn't know i didn't know oh him. really um, yeah, yeah so um strangely enough i saw broken stereo a couple times and he was in that so i had yeah. seen him but i didn't know him and right. we we started talking and he uh he fixed it and it looked great and it played great and then he said hey my, he, he was in a cover band at the time and they were playing a show and he asked me to open up solo and i did and it was the first show i played in uh I played a show at the Midway. It was the first time I played in almost 10 years. Um, wow. Yeah. So it was, I took a long break. And uh, so Frank was like, if you ever want to get a band together to do these songs. And I was like, right on. So I got him. Yeah. Got a few other dudes. We changed the lineup a bunch of times and yeah. we're happy with what we have now. And then uh, we demoed a bunch of songs and Mark from Stateline Records, who I've been a friend with forever. Yeah. 
I just sent him the song saying, you want to hear these? Like, you know, take a listen. And he was like, I want to put them out. So the seven inch that we put out in 2017 was really never meant to come out. It was just something that he enjoyed. Like we weren't recording thinking like, Oh yeah. This, oh, okay. We, we did it all live. So there's really yeah. barely any overdubs on it. And he really liked it. He wanted to put it out. We did 10 songs and he picked four. And um, wow. yeah, he picked four and we put that out. And ever yeah. since then, we've been trying to record a full length. This is our fourth time in the studio trying to record this full, full length. I didn't like the way yeah. it sounded. I didn't like the way it felt. Yeah. I felt some of the songs were kind of old and I just didn't enjoy it. So new batch of songs, slightly vamped lineup. We added Joe on keys, which is a world oh, of difference. Right. And um, yeah, right now, where I mean, who knows now? We could get in a room and totally forget how to play our songs. But before yeah, right. all this started, like I feel like we're as strong as we could be, and uh, the record's almost done, and we just need to wait till the studio opens up again and uh, get back at it. You know, because you launched you launched the Kickstarter right before, or it closed the Kickstarter kind of right before. That was by the happened, skin of our teeth, really. Yeah. Um, I've always been against it, Kickstarters. Um, just because, I, yeah, because I kind of felt like, I don't know. I kind of felt like it's almost not taken advantage of, but maybe I felt that like, nobody's going to care about this. Like I'm going to put a Kickstarter up and I'm just going to be staring at the screen at that zero dollar, <laughs> just like w waiting right. for it. Um, but people donated and I was shocked and um, it was awesome for us because we would have just been piecemealing it together for the next two years, you know? Right. Um, Cause it's not cheap to do all that. Um, you know, so that was really awesome. And just by the skin of our teeth, we, we wrapped up probably in like December on the Kickstarter fit in January, right around there. Yeah. If we had waited any longer, like nobody in their right minds running a Kickstarter now, like, <laughs> Give us your money right. so I can put our little record out. Meanwhile, right. the world is collapsing. So by the skin right. of our teeth, we, the Kickstarter happened. People were really interested in it, and I think we had kind of cool perks. Meanwhile, this week, I'm making 18 mixtapes for people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, three of them want actual tapes, cassette tapes. Really? Yeah, and I'm ready to do it. And I think 14 one so CDs. Did you buy them all before everybody shut down? Like you just had cassette tapes on hand? Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Ready? <laughs> you see that? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I have cassette wow. tapes, right? Yeah, right. And then a few people want like Spotify mixtapes. It's like not as fun, yeah. but I'll do it. So, um, yeah. so we had really cool perks and people dug it and – um we were blown away every day. We'd be texting each other being like, why is this hat? This, this isn't making sense. <laughs> like yeah, there's right. so many cool bands out there. Why is this happening? So we were really flattered that people gave a shit. So um, yeah, we just got to get in a room and finish it. It's mostly done. All the drums are done. All the bass is done. 90% of the guitars are done. We just need keys, some vocals, and then some bells and whistles and we'll be done mixing. They'll just need to be mixed and mastered. And yeah so well it, launching a successful kickstarter then sort of forces you to actually finish it so you can't sort of screw around because now you have deadlines right we we well we don't have deadlines necessarily but for me it's i mean nobody the, has deadlines now but. <laughs> no well for me it's the exact <laughs> opposite like even talking you know to franklin who's who out of the who's the only like original member you know we've always gone in with 500 bucks in our pocket and we needed to just play live bang it out not necessarily worry about tones just try to dial something mm -hmm. in that's okay and kind of run with it but now we do have a little bit of breathing room where we can kind of go in and take advantage of like all the vintage amps that they have at this place and you know really sort of get into making a record as to oppose of like let's just see how many live songs we can bang out so yeah. yeah does getting to play around with the cool gear does that sort of change songs um or change the way you yeah, structure it, things or, it doesn't yeah. change it, it it adds like like um 
we record in Wachusa recording. Um, oh, okay. With Roger Lavalle out in Princeton, Mass. And uh, he has a 12 string Rickenbacker. So, like, if there's any reason why I'm going to this studio, I love Roger and he's great. <laughs> right. And he has a lot of really cool vintage, like, Vox amps and, yeah. like, but um, he has a 12 string Rickenbacker, right? Okay. So all over the record, you'll hear a little like chimey yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. That like, I grew up on all that stuff. So like, yeah. I'm really happy to do that. So yeah, you just have a lot of freedom. You know, when the drummer has seven snare drums to choose from and he's not just bringing his beat up one, like it's just, it's kind of cool. And it's not a luxury yeah. that we usually have. So yeah. Where is Princeton, Massachusetts? As somebody who's lived here forever, I don't know Princeton. It's kind of like if you go by Worcester, almost like you're going to, uh, if you're going out towards like sort of Fitchburgy, Lemonster, okay. kind of like out in yeah. that direction. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a nice little studio and it's, yeah, we're super comfortable there too. So um, yeah. Because you're from you're from Worcester originally. Yeah, just just right? out yeah the safe suburbs. Yeah, just outside of Worcester. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if there are people that are watching, I know a few people that have checked in that aren't from around here. Worcester is like due west of Boston, about an hour, you'd say. Yeah. And it it might as well be Ohio to a lot of people. It's like Worcester is the end of uh, civilization. It's like Worcester, Ohio, California. I think if you drive west in that order, it's because uh, I grew up in Nashua, so like an hour mm. north of Boston. Yep. I don't think I set foot in Worcester until I was an adult because there was never a reason to. Because shows that would, uh, yeah, Worcester, uh, shows would go to Boston and we'd go there, or they'd go to Providence, or of they'd course. go to like the Elvis Room in Portsmouth. Yep. So it was never a reason to go to, and I actually because of this went to look through my whole list of shows I've kept a list of every show I've oh, ever been to nice try to find killer. things from Worcester I, I mean obviously I've been to the Palladium I saw uh -huh. Springsteen at the DCU Center, the center yeah Central and, yep and I couldn't think of anything else I can't find anything yeah else. we um growing up we always went to Providence um, yeah just because it was easy so we went down to Club Babyhead a lot um, the old yeah. Met a lot, uh, the living room, Lupos, like clubs like that. Every once in a great while, we'd journey up to the Elvis room. Not often, but yeah. if there was like something yeah. going on, we were like, you know what? We got to go to the Elvis room. We'd go. Yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah. And then Boston was kind of like, the, I mean, the rat. We went, we took yeah. the train in on Sundays to go to the rat. Um, but Worcester... Worcester and Boston are this weird thing where it's like when we play a show in our hometown in Worcester, it's like getting people from Boston is like a, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough sell. Yeah. So we yeah, usually throw right. a few friends on, like we play Ralph's or if we play Hotel Vernon, we'll throw a few of our Boston friends bands on and they'll drag yeah, yeah. a few people out. Um, but yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough. Um, it really, it's Worcester might as well be Ohio. For I, a lot of people. I, I tell so people, yeah, yeah. My day job is for a hospital that's based in Worcester. Mm -hmm. And when it's a rehab. And so you, we try to recruit people. We take people from all over the place. Uh, but when you tell them that it's in Worcester, they're like, uh, uh, I don't want to go to Worcester. I'm like, well, we'll pick you up. Like, we have transportation. You don't have to worry about it. Because Worcester, <laughs> they feel it sounds like it's Cleveland. Uh, but yeah. it's not. Yeah, were there were there venues in Worcester? Were there places to play back in the uh, mid nineties? Back, yeah, I remember. Um, we used to put shows on at Ralph's, and I oh, okay. remember. I remember, and my memory is pretty terrible. <laughs> yeah. Pretty terrible. Right. But me and my cousin put on a show at Ralph's with. So, ah, uh, fuck, Showcase Showdown headlined. And okay, th and then there was a bunch of local bands. And it yeah, was the yeah. first show we ever put on. We didn't know how to put on a show, but we did. Yeah. We put on this fucking yeah. show at Rails. I remember walking up to Tom after the show from Showcase Showdown and yeah. paying him in like a Ziploc bag of like <laughs> fucking quarters and buttons. And it was like, right. it's all we, it's all right. we have. Meanwhile, like 
50 kids came to the show, but I think I started paying yeah. like the lesser known bands first. Like I had no clue how to do this. Um, right. But yeah, we put on shows at Ralph's. There was the Espresso Bar, which was a big club in Worcester that um, I met a lot of friends at that I still see, like um, the Westies, if you remember them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like Doug, who ended up being in uh, Ducky Boys and James from Dropkick Murphys had the Westies. Yeah. And we'd go see them and they were kids. They were a lot younger than me. Um, but yeah, there was a fun little sort of scene because a lot of kids from Western Mass would come to Worcester. Oh, okay. So we didn't have to worry about Boston. We didn't have to worry about that. Boston kind of came to Worcester at some point. Yeah. Like it got to a point where there was enough sort of buzz where like Dropkick Murphys would come and play the Espresso Bar. and uh, Maybe know. I did go to the Espresso Bar. Yeah. Because there's one show from back then that I couldn't place. Like I wrote who I saw, but I couldn't place. Hmm. But I feel like now that you mentioned the Espresso Bar, maybe I think I did see Showcase Show down there. You definitely like, could have, yeah. The McVeighs, if you remember the McVeighs. Yeah, yeah. And then this band, the Double O Zeros, and I remember nothing at all about them. But you, you, I, we went for Showcase Showdown. You probably did, because the thing about Espresso Bar is it was when, like, punk was really booming. It was like, if you were on Epitaph, you might as well have been on a major label. I mean, there was some... Yeah, right. Really, so Espresso Bar would get, like, the business... They did that business okay. dropkicks tour. And I remember once yep. they had um, the U.S. Bombs came. And if you don't know the Espresso Bar, it's an all-ages, alcohol-free, drug-free <laughs> sort right. of club. And there was a bar next door. It was London Billiards next door. And I, I know I'm not speaking out of school here, but, like, Dwayne was – so fucking shit-faced at this show <laughs> with a bunch yeah. of kids. I mean, it was fucking unbelievable. Right. But it was all kids. It was fucking kids. Right. It was like 20-year-olds. But, like, they would pull in these huge bands because it was just, like, it was at the time where those bands, you couldn't have enough clubs. They would sell out wherever they went. You know, they, yeah. they, would, they would sell out wherever they went because, I mean, it was huge. You know, Bouncing Souls, Blank 77 were really big at the time. Bands like that. I mean... I forgot about Blank 77 until you said that. Wow. Yeah, they they played a bunch. I mean, it wasn't really a crowd I was sort of in with, the sort of spiky. Yeah. It, it's yeah, not yeah, right. kind of my thing. Because, I mean, I grew up just on, like, fucking classic rock. So I didn't grow yeah. up on, like, punk rock. I grew up on, like, right. the Beatles and Tom Petty and, like, Bob Dylan. Right. So, like, the spiky right. screaming shit, just, like, I, I... At the time, I couldn't handle it. Um, now I have a yeah. lot of friends that do it and it's great, but yeah, at the time, um, I couldn't do it, but yeah, it was such a cool scene at the time. And then it sort of just went away. And Espresso bar went away. So when did that shut down? Um, did they shut down or did they just stop doing shows? They shut down. They, they totally went out of business. It was, it was probably like early two thousands. Okay. Yeah. If I have to say, and, um, and then I stopped doing music for a long time. So I obviously still always went to shows and but I just stopped doing yeah. music. So um yeah. Um it's uh why just kinda got sick of it? Or? Life, you know, it's kinda yeah. like you know, you get married or you well, I had a kid when I was real young and that sort of made me be like, I can't go on tours, I can't I gotta be around yeah. and uh right. you know, just so yeah, life kinda got in the way. But I always wrote songs. I had notebooks full of songs, but I just didn't have a band and I didn't play shows. I just, I didn't record. I didn't do anything. I just had notebooks of songs. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but so uh, when, why did you get back into it? That's when your cousin passed? That yeah, my cousin like passed little... away and um, I never thought I would do a band again, really. I was just like, he was in every band I was ever in. I was kind of like, ugh. Yeah. I, I just, I didn't want to do it. But then when Franklin sort of, you know, dug the songs enough and he was like, let's do something. I was like, this will be good. And then we made, yeah. I made of, I made a, an EP with my son and one of my other cousins yeah, yeah, yeah. called uh, adding insult to industry. And there's four songs on that. And we put it out, we made a little record release show. And I thought this is going to be the only show we're going to play, but it's going to be great. Like we're going to play this yeah. one show and it's going to be fucking awesome. And our friends are going to yeah. show up and we did it. And, uh, and then there was just more shows and, you know, it was just kept going and going. So, yeah. yeah. What do you think your favorite show you've played, your favorite lineup? Because you played with some cool bands. Uh, yeah, it's a tough call. I mean, 
we did wreck the halls in 2017 and mm -hmm. um that was cool because i mean i have a lot of respect for those guys and what they do and how they run things and uh but it was also like i mean anybody in the boston music scene knows how well you get treated at the sinclair if you play the sinclair yeah, it, right. it, it, it's not like a secret like Right. When you right. play there, you're treated like a real musician. Like you're treated like a yeah. real band. They're like, when would you like food, del food delivered to your green room type <laughs> of shit? Like all the monitors right. work and they sound yeah. great. Like it's just, yeah. it's unbelievable. So you're like your name's on the backdrop and it's just like, right. it's like shit that you just like fucking read about. So that they was treat me it. nice, and I'm nobody. <laughs> like dude, I don't play in a band, dude. It's, I it's, take pictures sometimes, and they're yeah. awesome to me, so, dude. Yeah. It's it's great, but you know, I mean, honestly, as like I get older, it's like we we played with some pretty cool bands, um, and a lot of bands like that are heroes, like Swing and Utters we played with, um, Wayne, yeah. Uh, uh, but um, you just want to play with your friends, really, is what it really comes yeah. down to. You know, you just yeah. want to play shows with your friends. And it's, yeah. I'm happy if I can play with a lot of the bands that I like in Boston, like I'm all good. Like, yeah. it's, it's cool to get on like thrown on like a show. Like we played with the dead. Did you go to that dead boys show? I didn't No, We played with the dead boys at once. Was that at Brayton? Oh, once. It was okay. at once. And like, it was really cool. Like, I mean, they were great. They were really yeah. great. And, um, I always like playing shows where I feel like we're like the odd, the odd band. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, that was like a punk, a punk rock show. And I yeah, felt right. like we were kind of the odd band and I always like doing that. I always like being that. So like, it's really cool. Like I said, to play with some of those bands, but when you can play with friends of yours, that's really where it's at, whether it's up in Lowell or whether it's in, you know, at O'Brien's or whether wherever. Yeah. Like that, that's where it's at. Like that, that's why it's fun, you know. That swing in Huddersfield was pretty cool and weird too, though, wasn't it? Cause wasn't it you guys and uh, Gallows Bound? Gallows Bound, Gallows Bound, and then yeah. swing in Huddersfield. That was pretty. Yeah, eclectic. it was a, eclectic. It was a killer lineup, and it was like, um, I mean, swing and Hutters are like, yeah, right. fuck. Like, I mean, you know, <laughs> who who doesn't like the swing and Hutters? They're like one of those bands where like they're not um you know they're not a band that people are wishy-washy on like right. they're just one of those bands that did it right they took some time off they did what they needed to yeah. do and like every record just keeps getting fucking better and better so to play with them was just like <laughs> like you know that's a cool room up there too yeah it is that's a cool spot where yeah. um where did the transition to punk rock come from from your classic rock upbringing because that sounds like our upbringings are sort of the same just like an hour apart but yeah where did the transition into punk rock come um, from you know if i had to connect the dots like i grew up listening to i mean the beatles like first tape i ever got was the white album followed by thriller and born in the usa and i wore all those out so That's from there it, it just went to tom petty it went to bob yeah. dylan heavy when i was i mean yeah. i mean imagine going on the bus and there's all the back patches and there's the thin mustaches and there's the poofy sneakers and there's the whole thing. And you have your yeah. Bob Dylan, you know, your Bob Dylan tape right. on. I remember in 1991, I remember this specifically, 91, 92, right around there, I got on the bus and some kid was like, what are you listening to? And I was like, traveling Wilburys, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like, what the fuck? Right. So I was so kind of bummed about it that I went yeah. out and bought what I thought was a fucking metal, just, oh, <laughs> when they find out I'm listening to this, the, yeah, yeah. they're going to fucking love me, right? Right. So I went out and bought a record that's still one of my favorite records to this day that came out right around then, and they still continued to shit all over me, and it was the first Black Crows record. Shake your money, mate. That's a great record. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah, they have long hair. They're wearing yeah, right. fucking leather pants. <laughs> They're wearing leather pants. I remember saying right. that to a kid. They had leather pants. Like, what are you doing? Right. So after that, it was really just Nirvana that did it. 
it was yeah. Nirvana in like 91, 92. And then seeing Nirvana in 93 on the In Utero tour, you know, and then everybody's dying their hair and then punk rock and yeah. then Green Day. And then, you know, and then it just, and then it went from there, really. I mean, that's. Did Nirvana ever come through Worcester in those early days? Because they would play in the early, early days. They would play places like I Ralph's, think I'm they sure. played Clark University, I think, I want to say. Oh, okay. Like one of the small rooms at Clark. I'm not 100% sure, but I think they did. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't old enough to really be allowed to go see them alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the first concert I went to was in 1989. And by the time I really got into them, it was like 92. And I was like a freshman in high school. And my mom, I don't think my yeah. mother's like, I'm not going to let you go to this. Right. But right. by the time they came back around and played in Springfield on the In Utero tour, I was allowed to yeah. go. So, yeah. Um but yeah, Nirvana was a big was a big deal. Um, and right around the same time, of course, it was like the Ramones and the Clash. So, yeah. yeah, I feel like I did it the right way as far as you know. Like, I feel like I got pretty eclectic taste, which I which which is helpful, especially when you're writing songs. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because even the way that you write, and even the covers that you record, are not sort of your traditional covers you'll cover a lot of bands from like your your early listening days whether it's dylan or tom petty or mm. stuff like that i think that stuff is cool yeah well it's um and it's it's nice having the band that we do because we're all from such different backgrounds uh you know like timmy and um timmy and franklin are younger than me and yeah. you know pop punk and, and and stuff like that and metal and you know, Jeff, our drummer, a lot of hardcore stuff. And um, so it's cool to have that sort of um, wealth of just listening experience in a band, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's it's helped for sure. Yeah. And it sort of gives you a sound that's a little bit like you're able to sort of uh, accurately cover a lot of different ground. You know what I mean? You don't have a sound necessarily. Because you could fit in with a rock and roll show, a air quotes rock and roll show, yeah. or a punk rock show, and all points in between. Yeah, I think that's important too for us, anyways. But it's just like, it's just you grow up listening to things, and it's like it's just what you know. Like nobody, I don't think anybody really sits down and be like, "I'm gonna write a song that sounds like," you know. You just get yeah. an idea in your head, and you sit down and you write it, and you know. But for me, it's just like it's like studying. It's like, yeah. when you, when you listen to music, you study and you just like, at the end of a line, you're like, well, Tom Petty would go up, Bruce Springsteen yeah, would yeah. go down. It's just like, right. you're stealing, but you're not, you're just taking inflections kind of. And it's, yeah, and right. it, and it, I think it's awesome. You know, it's, it's the best part about doing it, you know? Well, I think we're also in an age where it's, I don't want to say, okay but it's okay to admit that you have those influences like Tom Petty and Bruce Springsteen. I think for a while, mid nineties, it was maybe not so cool to admit you liked Bruce Springsteen and Tom Petty and Johnny Cash and all that. Yeah, it wasn't, <laughs> it definitely wasn't well, cool. Um, oh, I know. Um, but yeah, it got cool. And I don't know why. I don't know how. Yeah. I mean, it's stuff I, I've listened to, but yeah. I vividly remember going to, a specific day going to Newbury comics in Nashua mm -hmm. and I bought three albums the same day. I bought a Mr. T experience. Love is dead. Okay. Yeah. I bought a, uh, do you remember John Cougar concentration camp? Oh yeah. Yeah. But a John Cougar concentration camp record that had uh hurt. So their cover of hurt so good on it, which I thought was a riot. Yeah. And then I bought Springsteen's greatest hits. And I remember the look of the guy behind the counter looking <laughs> Bruce Springsteen's greatest hits, and I totally bailed. I was like, "Oh, it's it's for my mom," because <laughs> I because I wanted to be cool. I was whatever seventeen. I wanted to be cool, and you yeah. couldn't have a Bruce Springsteen greatest hits record. Uh, but that record is fire. <laughs> I mean, yeah, his greatest hits record. It's like it's unfair. Like same thing. Yeah. Same thing with Tom Petty. Like I get into debates about Tom Petty with people. Cause that's what I do. I just argue about music with people, but um, <laughs> like, you being from Massachusetts. yeah, you can't name <laughs> an American songwriter with more distinguishable songs. 
You can't. You can't. I could list you 15 Tom Petty songs that my mom knows. And who's yeah, not even right. like a big, but I mean, if you just go riding down a dream, free fall and won't back down, American Girl Refuge. I mean, there's so many. Yeah, it's it's right. unbelievable. Right. And uh, last year we got to play in Gainesville, and I was just nerding out the whole time. Oh, I, think, yeah. I think my yeah. band was just like, "What's he doing?" <laughs> I just I dropped right. them off at Fest in the morning, and I got in the rental car and I drove around to like all these old houses. I'm like, he lived there. Like I found all the spots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't right, get a soul right. to go with me, but actually, That's right. a couple of guys in Secret Spirit wanted to go with me, but I think they slept in, and I was just up and at them. So <laughs> yeah, they, right. they had a they had a much better fest than I did, I think, <laughs> or more fun. <laughs> well, <laughs> depends on what you consider best, because I would totally in, work out on that stuff. I'm also in my in my forties, so like they're not. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, but um, no, and I'm glad I finally one of the last shows I went to before. Uh, the plague happened. Um, Secret Spirit played. Uh, that band is awesome. I'm glad I finally got to see them. That band rules. Yeah, they're like, they're one of those bands that just like, the second you see them, you're like, yep. Yeah, they got, exactly. Like, like, they gives you goosebumps, kind of. You're like, all right, they're. Yeah. I mean, j just seeing them for. I I saw them at. They played a show in Worcester at um, at Hotel Vernon. I forget who else played, but um. Anytime it's like a show there, I try to like stop in. And, like I want to like yeah. pay and like whatever. And I didn't know who they were and I didn't know them. And I saw them and I was yeah. like, what the fuck? Like sometimes there's bands where like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm glad we don't play that kind of music because like, yeah, yeah. It, it would make you just want to hang up your guitar. Like right. I'm not right. going to be that good. Like I can't, right. I can't do it. Like they're so fucking great. Um, like imagine following them on a bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i mean we haven't had we we've played with yeah. them we haven't had to follow them i would yeah. i would try not to um right we played with them at the shaskeen recently oh, yeah. which was yeah. a really fun night that's was, a fun place yeah it's the first time i've ever been so yeah it was a great tim berry that's one of tim berry's favorite places to play that's he comes up and plays there every year that's and he I just, did. like, he, he fell in love with Manchester. He <laughs> walks the train tracks. He goes down to the river and fishes. And it's really oh, wow. awesome and weird. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. all in, huh? Yeah, yeah, he loves it up here for whatever reason. Yeah, no, it's a great little club. i am uh, got to get back there when this hall ends. <laughs> we all <know. laughs> I mean, it's going to be funny. It's going to kind of be like, once, once there starts being shows, are people going to go? Like, are people going to yeah. go out to shows? Are people going right. to be jaded? Or right. are people going to feel like we got to get in all the fun we can in case this happens again? Like, I don't know. Right. It's going to be interesting to see I, what happens. I I posted something just on my Facebook page the other day and Daniel from Rebuilder who books a bunch of different clubs in mm -hmm. Boston, but mm -hmm. uh, the Hong Kong and Charlie's especially. And he's like, what happens if we open up, but they cut capacities at clubs. Mm -hmm. So the club capacity is 90 but what's because of social distancing, what if they only allow 55 in now? Mm -hmm. And then what does that do to a show? And does that even warrant, is it even worth having shows if they're going to cut capacities that small? And that, Yeah. Like, I mean, I kind of think, I mean, I could be wrong, but I kind of think that it's almost going to be like bands are going to be forced to take a step down as far as the venues yeah. they play because Let's say you're a band, and I can't even think of one, but let's say you're a band that's worked through the whole scene. You started playing O'Brien's, and then you yeah. played Great Scott, and then you played Sinclair. And like a band that's just really, like, yeah, yeah. you may, for the sake of people's well-being in the scene, like, it would be great for a big band to go, you know what, we're going to do five nights at O'Brien's. We're going to yeah. do five nights at Great Scott, a band that could sell out who knows what. Because it right. would just jumpstart things, I think. Because if you do have a lower capacity, I don't know. Do you have a higher ticket price? I don't know. I mean, it's right. It's going to be something. I mean, bottom line, people are just going to have to go out and support and, you know, and see what and happens. It's a matter of what phase of society getting back to normal does going to shows come in. Like, is that one of the first things that happens or is that like, the end? no, I mean, I know, like, I know, I know California said no, no shows till 2021. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't make, I kind it, of feel like that's where we're headed. It just doesn't make sense. As much as I want to go to a show, it just, 
I, I mean, I don't know what it would take for me to be comfortable in a room with 200 people right now. I, I, I right. certainly wouldn't do it now, but I mean, who knows? Yeah, or do you put seats in at shows? <laughs> like, I don't know. Speaking of the Sinclair, I went to one show at Sinclair last year and that I walked into is Craig Finn from Hold Steady Play. Oh, I wanted to go to that. A, yeah. He played a seated show. Yep. And so I had never seen a seated show at Sinclair, and I was actually a little – like I thought I was in the wrong place for a minute because I've never seen chairs there. Uh, but it was definitely, I mean, it's, it's a much smaller capacity when you put seats at a place, mm. but, and it forces you and a show like that, you can do seated. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause it's a little, it's a lot of atmosphere and whatever, but that's one way to get around uh, having to pack a place is you put seats there, but who's going to go see secret spirit if there's chairs on the floor? <laughs> no, no, I mean, I think bands like that will just start going, you know, underground. They'll play basements. They'll play house yeah. shows. Ba right. I mean, bands like that don't have anything to worry about because there's always those little, like, punk rock venues, like, even if it's not mainstream ones, but like I said, house shows, basement shows, you know, there there, there will be shows. But, you know, Daniel's right, especially with when they're talking about social distancing capacity, and he's right. I mean, who right. else? Who knows? Right. I mean, you know, you can't cut O'Brien's in half. What are you going to do? Say, right. all right, right. we're going to let the bands in? <laughs> That's yeah, it. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so. If you if you book five bands to play at the Hong Kong, there's your capacity. <laughs> I know. Just book one <laughs> ska band, and all of a sudden, they're going to yeah, be exactly. bumping into each other. It's like, yeah. No. I mean, who knows? It's going to be interesting, but, I mean, it's nice to see – you know, there's a lot of talented people out there and seeing what people are doing now, it's nice to see. I mean, yeah. I'm sick of my acoustic guitar at this point. Like, I'm sick of just hearing <laughs> my voice with it. I'm sick of playing yeah. it. I want to yeah. play, I want to plug into my amp and play loud and play with right. people. Um, but it's really just cool to see, like, our friends online just going on yeah. and just playing because it, it does give you some feeling of, like, normalcy, even though it's not normal. Right. It still gives you a feeling of hey, there's something going on. There's a show. Like I yeah, did yeah. one for um, Sarah's birthday for Mabel Syndrome there. Yeah. And uh, out Andy, out. Andy from The Drowns played and uh, Chris played from The Scars. And it almost yeah. felt like a real show that we weren't at. Like it was yeah, really yeah. cool. Like everybody jumped from one Instagram to the next Instagram. To the, it, was, yeah, it was cool. Yeah. It was just, yeah. it felt like a show. Except yeah. I was sitting on my bed without pants on, you know. <laughs> cool. Like spoiler alert. If that's all yeah. it takes, I'm okay. Yeah, right. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> but it would be nice to plug in once in a while though. Oh, like dude. I I love the fact that a lot of people are taking to Instagram and Facebook and whatever and doing these things, but I'm almost kind of tapping out of uh bearded guys playing acoustic guitars like, yes i'm trying I, to hit critical mass <laughs> yeah as one as one i can tell yeah, you right. that like right. um i can't i can't do another i can't do another like bruce springsteen cover and i can't do another ironic <laughs> cover like i just right. it's just like i want to play with the band again yeah um and our drummer works at a grocery store so well, it's sort of like that's sort of the one piece right there where everybody else is really pretty, pretty quarantining, pretty staying away yeah. from people, but he works at a grocery store. So it's kind of like, yeah, right. that's sort of where the chain breaks because if, if we all practice right. together and he works in a grocery store and he has caught, you know, it's like, yeah, right. we, we, we just don't want to put anybody at risk. So it's like, we just, you know, just crossing our fingers. Hopefully we can get into the studio maybe in May. I don't know. Even if it's just me to do some vocals, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say. So, what you to sort of circle back to that? What do you have left to finish up the full length? And do you so, have time on this point? So, um, I have a little bit of guitar to do, um, and we just have some like acoustic backing guitar that needs to go throughout the record. Um, Joe on keys needs to come in and do all his parts. So that's like a full day. Cause he's going to, you know, do organ and piano and the whole thing. And then we're going to have horns in a couple songs. So okay. we're going to bring them in in the half a day. So it's going to be crunch time. We might stretch it out to four days, but um, yeah. And I, I've written a couple new songs. So we're going to have two kind of slower 
songs on the record because I think it's important mm -hmm. to have kind of like mm -hmm. a couple downers. And yeah. before we went in, I had my two set. I knew what two I wanted. And then I wrote a new one. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> uh, this one's going to make. So so we got to yeah, figure yeah. that out. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm hoping, who knows? I mean, who knows? But yeah, I'm hoping that it comes out this year, you know. But Would that be through state line again? State line, or? state line, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, originally, we were looking September, um, yeah. September, October, but um, who knows? I mean, you know, who knows? It's uh, yeah. you got to finish it first, and then my <laughs> guess is because like they're still pressing. Like I know Pirates Press is still yeah. pressing records, so that's good. Mm -hmm. So the pressing plants aren't getting backed up because they're still making records. So. I'm just hoping that uh, I was getting it to them. Yeah. Yeah. We have all of our Kickstarter swag done. Thank God. Like yeah. once we got that money, we got all the Kickstarter shirts printed. We got all the screen printed covers printed. We got the pins, yeah. stickers, we got everything done. Yeah. Other than these mixed tapes that I got to do. Other than the record. <laughs> yeah. Mixed tapes. What's I'm going to, I'm going to crush yeah. those this weekend. I'm going to have a party this weekend <laughs> making mixed tapes. People are going to get some, people are going to get right. like, people are going to get like Jim Croce and then like, <laughs> you know, the replacements and Paul Simon on a tape. So like, yeah. Did they put together a list of what they wanted? No. Nope. They forget the, so it's just up to you to pick. To yeah. fill a 30 minute tape. Yeah, it's awesome. going to kind of be what I'm really into at the moment. Like, I can't stop yeah. watching um, Simon and Garfunkel live from Central Park. <laughs> it's on YouTube. Yeah, Fucking, yeah. I dare you to watch that and just put on headphones and like listen to the harmonies going on there. Yeah. And it's just like, what the fuck? Like, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So, I've been listening to a lot of that album lately so they'll get some of that for sure yeah of all of the kinds of music that go in circles and whatever there's not been a single thing like simon and garfunkel like that wouldn't come out now no. there's nothing that touches that now no stylistically it, or, yeah well the, the funny thing about it is if you listen to like a song like um like america or like um if you strip the words on a lot of those songs, yeah. you could hear like Lucero doing them. You know what I mean? Because it's still just like this story okay. about, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a very genuine story. And like you, you could hear a band like that doing almost any of those songs. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's all just, I mean, if you have good songwriting, you have good songwriting. It doesn't matter. Right. It just doesn't matter. I mean, it's just, right. they're just so good, you know, together it's, they're, unbelievable um, i know i'm not breaking any new ground but i'm saying like <laughs> they sound, oh, simon, simon and garfunkel, garfunkel sounds good together guys just so you know just the two voices unbelievable <laughs> it's too bad they hate each other yeah. it's too Those bad guys they, been something. and i've met them both really and, and they were both wicked assholes both of them both of them really yeah <clears throat> art more so yeah and i was crushed with the paul being a dick because i yeah. love graceland it's one of my favorite albums of all time yeah yeah. and i'm like oh you're a dick damn it like <laughs> like i've met a lot of people in right usually they're nice springsteen i met twice and he was awesome both times i've heard that yeah paul simon was a dickhead so but he might have had a bad day he might have like yeah, yeah right had right a fight with his wife. you know what i mean like it's so it's not fair to say like he's an asshole but like because you never know like what could be happening in people's lives at the time so they don't need me running up on him and be like remember when you did this stuff like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. he's had 35 years of people asking him when he's getting back together with art garfunkel and he probably just became a dick because of it i know i was even searching online because in 91 he did central park again alone yeah. on the rhythm of the saints tour and i'm like there has to be a documentary about this like because art's probably sitting at home being like what the fuck like we did this together <laughs> right. and like right. a billion people came and now you're just doing it alone like what was the yeah. interaction there yeah. i might have to just make i might have to make a, um a five minute short of what happened there i'll play both yeah. of them i'll play both of them <laughs> It'll be That's called like riot. it'll be called like Hello Darkness, my old friend, and it'll be like the Simon and Garfunkel <laughs> five minute story. But how there hasn't been a Netflix documentary? There's a lot of Netflix documentaries 
uh, about that are actually really well done. How there hasn't been one about Simon and Garfunkel yet? Yeah, I don't know. there there hasn't been. Um, I usually go for the um, the bad made for cable like rocky like like docu uh, like biopics. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. not the real ones that come out in theaters, but the sort of weird ones on VH1. <laughs> Have you ever seen right, any of right. those? So there's oh, a, yeah, yeah. there's a Def Leppard one. Did you see the Def Leppard one where he gets oh, into a car of... accident, gets into a car accident, and then it's just him standing in a field, like with his arms squirting blood. <laughs> right? You can find this online. And then he just goes, I think I lost me arm and his blood like <laughs> These are so bad. There's a meatloaf one. That's awesome. There's one if like it's called like what if John Lennon and Paul McCartney like reconciled and it's all fake. They're, they're crazy. I'll send you the links. <laughs> they're great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So That's yeah, awesome. yeah. Any sort of music thing, I'll watch. But you're right. A Simon and Garfunkel deep dive documentary. Oh, absolutely. Needs I watched the hell out of that. Needs to be done, yeah. but they're probably just both pricks and like neither of them are going to sign off on it and it would have to be unauthorized. Yeah, right. and... But then, so then it becomes like just talking to people who knew them and it's kind of... You can't weird. have that. No, you, you yeah. can't have that. The The best ones are the ones that they're in. Like they got to be in it. Yeah. Like the, yeah. that's why like, I love the Beatles anthology, but one of the Beatles yeah. before they die have like Paul needs to write a real autobiography like warts and all but i think they need to protect that brand so much that there's there's just like no shit talking it's all just like yeah, yeah. Hey, I and ringo's in all into peace and love now so yeah. he wouldn't do it i swim in money <laughs> i just have so much of it like they just right. why would they do anything to be like you know i right. don't know but yeah i love all that stuff all that sort of just <laughs> stuff yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I don't know how we're set for time. I didn't even bring a watch with me. It's I know this will kick me off after an hour, but. All right. That means we have nine minutes to go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Did I? I kind of made a list, although I feel like we kind of talked about everything that was on my list of cool. uh, stuff to talk about. Thanks for doing this. This no, is cool. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad I got this. to be the guinea pig, the first person. And uh... I know. Yeah, this is this is cool. Is this going to save on on something? So it saves our story for 24 hours. There is a way that it, that's actually one of the things I have to guinea pig is a way to save them otherwise. All right. So all the nerds, uh, there's nine people in this room now. One of these nerds in here <laughs> can tell us, how do we just throw this up on YouTube? How does this happen? So Somebody knows. I I think what I have to do because I don't have an iPhone. I guess like iPhone has a screen recorder. Um, I use Android. Mm. So I downloaded a screen recorder app. What you can do is go back to, like I can go back to this. Oh, gotcha. Play it, watch it again, record it to the screen. So it'll be saved on my phone and then upload it to YouTube. I think that's what I'm going to do because I can't seem to figure out another way to do it. Yeah. But I know of people, uh, I know of people that have done it and I'll hit up, not to name drop, I'll hit up Corey Brandon because he's been doing them and posting them to YouTube a couple mm -hmm. days later. So yep. I'll kind of pick his brain about how to do it. No, Corey's great. Uh, I saw him at the he's Middle good. East downstairs. I think it was um, one of the revival tours, I think. Oh, okay. And I, and I, and I didn't know him at the time. It was like him, yeah. Laura Jane Grace. Um, yeah. I forget who else Chuck played, I'm sure. And yeah. I, I didn't know him. And I went away yeah. thinking, like, wow, like, do you know, uh, do you know Todd Snyder at all? Yeah, yeah. So he reminds I mean, me of Todd no, Snyder, no. Yeah. who I love. Yeah. He's from Nashville, and he's such a killer yeah. songwriter. Like, if you like John Prine and, like, singer-songwriters, right. right. he's kind of funny, and it's really good. And yeah. uh, he kind of reminded me of him a little bit. Like, I couldn't get enough of that uh, Girl Named Go song. I'm like, that song's yeah, so yeah. fucking good. That's so, um, yeah. Yeah, hit him up and be like, how do we save this? I can try on my end, too, because I have an iPad and an iPhone. and I'm Yeah, somebody – so I guess iPhone and iPad or whatever, because I don't use them, uh, they have a built-in screen recorder. So you, if you hit screen record and then hit play, then you're just recording what you – what your screen is showing. I guess mm. they, a lot of kids do it for, like, video games. Uh, oh. So – so there is a way to do it on Android, but only in like the 
the gaming little platform thing that's on the phone. So, but I downloaded a separate screen recorder. So I think if I go back in, hit record, and then play it, and then I can save it to my phone and upload it to YouTube. All right. Fingers crossed. All right. I mean, I could try the same too on my end. And uh, yeah, I'm sure between the two of us, <laughs> we can <laughs> we can we can figure this out. We can do this. Yeah. But, uh, See how many people I have to talk to to figure out how to save a damn video. But I know it will save. Assuming I do it correctly, it will save at least for 24 hours well, on our store. Right. So that means you have 24 hours to figure it out. Exactly. Exactly. Pressure's on. <laughs> you have 24 hours. It's like a bad, a bad movie. You have 24 hours it's to like, figure out how to record this. And keep it's it like that show computer. 24. It's, yeah. it's just like 24. Man, I haven't seen that show you, in a long time. When you keep for Sutherland. <laughs> yeah, which neither of us are, clearly. Yeah, no. No. So, uh, for, we, so we got four minutes left. I'm going to ask you this. What's your, yeah. top, what's your top five favorite live albums? So... I generally don't like live albums, uh, and I never buy them on vinyl. My top five, though, Face to Face's live album, okay. Lu Lucero's Live in Atlanta double album. Mm -hmm. uh, does the big Springsteen box set live no. compilation thing like no. that doesn't count? No, you can't. <clears throat> um, boy, because those are like the two that I listen to. See, the Springsteen um, one's a weird one because, like, if he released any full show from, like, 74 to, like, yeah, 78, yeah. it would be the greatest yeah. thing ever, but he refused to do it. Right. So, yeah, I... You, now, you, but, see, my parents had those on vinyl, and so I grew up listening to those. Absolutely. So, like, a lot of, like, Rosalita, the version of Rosalita I know is the one from yep. that. Oh, yeah. Not necessarily the album version. We had the album versions, but those albums got played to death in a good way mm -hmm. at my parents' house. So, uh, so that those are like the the versions of songs. Although the Lucero album is like that too, the Lucero live double album. I like a lot of the versions on that better than the original ones. Yeah. So when I go back and listen to the original ones, I'm like, Ew. yeah, that, that you don't sound like that now. <laughs> yeah. No, that's yeah. No, I. Uh... Somebody asked me the other day. That's why I'm asking you because I I'm still trying to figure out mine, and I think mine were um, I think I came up with um, Elvis Costello live at the El Combo, which is okay. insanely good. Yeah, yeah. And again, I'll say it again: Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel live at Central Park. Okay. Tom Petty has a live anthology, which I'm going to say I don't know if it counts because if I said your Bruce one doesn't count, I don't think my Tom yeah, Petty exactly. one would count. Um, right. But I grew up just on live. Like I, I'd be buying the bootlegs and downloading the bootlegs, and uh, I loved them. For Pearl Jam, I do that. I have probably seventy Pearl Jam bootlegs. Oh yeah, because they release them for real though. Like they, they, they did. Do it yeah. Right. Well, so back in the day though, you used to be able to go to. We had Rocket Records in Nashua, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you would spend forty dollars on like a Japanese import bootleg of a show from '93 in San Jose or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. Oh I yeah. Had all of those. I, I mean, their live, they they did a live acoustic thing, double album live at Benaroya Hall is really good because mm -hmm. it sounds amazing. Yeah, uh, and they kept in the fuck ups too, so oh, that good. Part was cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's uh, I grew up on live records, so like the Jay Giles records, the live Jay Giles oh, records yeah, yeah, yeah. are like yeah, just yeah. bananas. Like, yeah. you know, they recorded them in Detroit. That's where all the good live records are done in the seventies right. up in Detroit. So it's a live Neil Young. Bones. Neil Young's Live Rust has to be on there. See, here, here's, uh, here's the hot take. Neil Young can't do it. I've tried. I try my really? hardest. I just, I, I, I can't. I can't. People yeah. are like, but Buffalo Springfield, I can do. I can do. They rock. Really? But, but Neil, I just, I, I, I don't even tell a lot of people this. This is like a, this is like a hot take here. Like oh, I'm embarrassed to say that like, I just, I can't do it. I try so hard and uh, maybe I got to try again. Maybe I just got to put on. I get it. Well, it's also a matter of where you try to jump into the Neil Young catalog. If you pick one of those weird albums from the eighties, like Hawks and Doves, I think there's one. That's, that's garbage. Yeah. It's one with the star uh, on it. Yeah. I know that one. Yeah. Yeah. And those are, those are albums he put out just to dick with the record label so that he could get out of his contract. And so he put to, he put out some garbage for a while there. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, but I'm, I, I really got to try again, though. It's only fair. I'm going to try again. His greatest hits record is pretty good. That's a good place to start. Oh, we've got 30 seconds left. If anybody is watching uh, the next – so I'm going to do these every Monday and Thursday, 7 o'clock. Thurs, this Thursday will be Rob Rufus from the band Blacklist Royals. Oh, nice. Uh, and he also just wrote a book. It's called Vinyl Underground, and it's pretty good. Ooh, cool. So yeah. We were going to promote that before, so now we'll do it this way. Nice. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. Absolutely. Everybody.